The use of drones to cause harm has become a new age threat. And in the military, everybody wants to fight the next war, not the last war. It's the possible dark side of an otherwise exciting market. Drone Shield provides detection and defeat against consumer and commercial drones. People talk about fintechs. We are a deaf tech, defense technology business. The traditional need for a startup, doesn't matter if it's defense tech or any sort of business, is capital. You need patient capital. How did you work out how much you need to raise the first time? Probably knowing you have to go back again and again and again. Mm -hmm. why, why do they pick? Australia instead of trying to do it on the NASDAQ. You're letting Genie out of the bottle. This is quite a stressful process. Oleg Vornik, welcome to Going Public. Thank you for having me, Mark. Your face is familiar. Where do I know your face from? We met eight years ago when you were presenting me with my Australian citizenship certificate at the Wallara Council. I seem to recall that um, I had to replace Malcolm Turnbull who couldn't make it. You were. I think he was Prime Minister at the time, so you're filling in for him as he was on his duties. Yeah, he was busy being Prime Minister, so uh, you got second place. <laughs> you didn't get the Prime Minister, you got Mark Boris. But now you are the CEO and Managing Director of a company called Drone Shield. You first joined as CFO in 2015. Tell me what Drone Shield does first. Drone Shield provides detection and defeat against consumer and commercial drones, like small drones you can buy a JB Hi-Fi kind of store used for nefarious applications. We have started seeing drones used in war. So for example, in Ukraine, where we've been present on the Ukrainian side since the start of the conflict, you have both sides using drones for Belfield reconnaissance. Russians, of course, been using drones kamikaze style with weaponized warheads. We've been seeing drones being used for cyber attacks, for scouting enemy positions, directing artillery fire and the like. In civilian situations, we're seeing drones being used for terrorism. So delivery of dangerous substances or explosives to crowded places like stadiums disrupting airports, delivering drugs across borders, contraband into prisons. The range of creative nefarious applications is, is pretty wide. And, and today we're a global business in about 100 countries around the world. So the business is combination of hardware and software to protect against drones. What's the shield do? Like, can I go and buy one of these things? For the detection, you can. For the defeat, unfortunately, no. So this is one of those situations where technology is racing ahead of the legislation. So when it comes to taking down drones, the current law does not distinguish between, say, a small drone for $2,000 and a Qantas airplane. So just right. like if you have a Qantas plane flying over your house, you can't get annoyed and shoot it down. For similar reason, you're not allowed to shoot down a, a drone. So most of our customers today are government agencies, but we do get a lot of inquiries from private individuals with exactly the concern you're having, which is very legitimate to say, if a drone is outside my window, is it looking at me? Is it filming? What is it doing? It's not supposed to be there, which is entirely true, but very different, very difficult to prosecute in those situations. What does a drone shield do? Does it shoot it down? Like what are we talking about here? We send a radio frequency signal that is strong enough to disorient the drone. So the drone loses connection to the pilot, to the satellite, and basically says, I'm lost. I'm just going to safely land myself and then you can pick it up and do investigation and also works a swarm of drones. So swarming is a really big theme now where some people might send a swarm of 10, 20 drones. You might be seeing these fireworks these days made out of drones. So exactly the same technology. Or light shows. Or light shows. And our technology can take down entire swarm when it's used in a nefarious context. So what you do is for commercial purposes, we do, we do all of it. Uh, so our customers today include defense, intelligence community, critical infrastructure owners, airports. It's just depending on what country and specifically what user we might be able to sell them just the detection or detection and defeat. And in some cases- Defeat actually, means what? What do you mean Taking down drones taking or, down. or jamming. In some cases, we actually don't recommend defeat at all. And we say, go with the detection. For example, if you're a prison and you have a guy outside the prison 
taking a drone and delivering, let's say, a loaded handgun into a prison, which is a really big problem, you don't necessarily want to just take down the drone because you're not solving the issue, but instead our system can tell you where the pilot is in real time and also where the drone lands in real time. So you can go and apprehend and arrest the pilot and then you apprehend the inmate who picks up the package, you conduct investigation, you solve the issue. And that way it's also a much bigger deterrent because one thing is to know as a pilot, you might just lose your drone, tomorrow you'll turn up with a different drone. Another thing entirely is if you know you might go to prison because you're caught doing this. You might end up in prison next to the person you're trying to drop the handgun to <laughs> or the drugs. And and these are big issues, Yes, they're, they're big, big issues in relation to prisons, uh, especially airports. On airports, I often think to myself, you never see a bird at the airport. And I often think, why don't I ever see a bird at the airport? Particularly when the airports, are, our airport in Sydney at least, is right next to it was in Botany Bay, and there's a lot of seagulls around. Mm. Um, and I always think to myself, you know, the worst thing of getting a seagull or a, a bunch of seagulls caught into the engine because you know, you know, there's going to be a major problem. Um, does Drone Shield operate in those environments too? We do. We don't scare birds. There are a lot of techniques to scare birds, like you have well, scarecrows is probably the most classic technique. But they do all kinds of, you know, they do shots to scare them and and other things. Uh, we do detection and taking down of drones. It's actually really interesting. I was at a conference a little while ago and FAA person, FAA, of course, US agency in charge of aircraft safety, was talking how in the early days they were testing engines of aircraft for bird strikes. And the way they were doing it, they would take frozen chickens and th throw frozen chickens into the engines just to see what happened. And the Rolls-Royce engines would be fine. So then FAA went to drone manufacturers and said, can we borrow some drones to throw them into the engine? And Rolls-Royce was saying, no, no, we're not loaning you any engines for that. You're just going to burn through the engines. Because of course, now you have largish objects with metal parts in them, lithium-ion batteries. So there's been all these studies that show that if a drone gets ingested into an engine, you're going to blow out the engine and potentially take down the airliner, which is why today, if you have a drone detected at an airport precinct, no flights can take off, no flights can land, doesn't matter what cost, because you're creating a really grave danger to the aircraft. So just tell me through how Drone Shield came about. Two US government engineers work in the defense space. They wanted to do something entrepreneurial, so they started Drone Shield in 2014. Whereabouts? Uh, this was in Virginia in the US. And we still have our US office back there. And it was a garage business, just like you described. They were using acoustics-based sensors. So much like today, like you described, you go to the beach, you hear that annoying sound overhead, you look up, you see a drone. So we're trying to do computerized version of that where you have highly sensitive microphones. They try to tune in to the buzzing sound and then the software at the back end separates between that and maybe sound of crickets or jackhammers or something else. They had an initial breakthrough in 2014 and then 2015 with Boston Marathon protecting against terrorist threats using drones following on the bombings a couple of years earlier. And there was a Wall Street Journal article that was writing about this crazy technology that nobody previously considered being protection against these little drones that were becoming a thing, which really not a lot of people even knew how to fly a drone and what to do with it. A uh, New York fund read an article uh, about it and called the two founders and the guys were basically just running, you know, on a smell of an oil rag at the time with not much uh, revenue, well, virtually no revenue to speak of. Um, so they took investment from the fund, but the idea was they needed a lot more money to really scale the business in any, in any way. Um, so the fund called me because I was a banker at the time and I took a lot of companies Where public. Were you? I was with Royal Bank of Canada at the time and previously in America? In Sydney. In, in Sydney. Sydney. Yep. And previously with Deutsche Bank and ABN Amro. So I've done that sort of equity capital markets work uh, for quite some time. And I said, look, um, you don't have a lot of defense aerospace experience, but you would know how to take the business public. Can you please get involved? Which is how I became first the CFO of the business. And this was literally at this point a you know handful of people, less than half a dozen, you know, exploding industry, but very very early stage. So we took the business public on ASX. Um, it was about three hundred initial shareholders. Today we have about ten thousand, uh, mostly retail based, and raised seven million dollars on a twenty million dollar valuation. Uh, today we're about one hundred and fifty million market cap. And that 7 million gave us initial ability to hire 
more R&D stuff, so start scaling technology, salespeople, operational people. Um, I moved to the U.S. for two years to Virginia to basically learn the uh, defense trade. It's, it's one of those things. If you say want to be an actor, you move to Hollywood to learn to act. If you want to learn defense and intel, you go to Virginia because that's an equivalent. Uh, so spend two years bouncing around military installations there, um, developed or built up our U.S. sales team as I realized that you need to have the right accent to sell to those kind of agencies move back to Sydney and continue building the team. And um, we actually just finished in March a record capital raise, about $40 million at the time, and use that to continue scaling the business. We're about 85 people today, 75 in Sydney and 10 in the US. So what's your background? Mathematics degree. So my parents decided to foster my uh, my studies by always telling me that I was good at maths. I think initially there was really no basis for it, but you, I guess you tell yourself enough that you're good at something, so you you continue doing that. Uh, so I got a maths degree. I didn't really know what to do with it. I guess you become a maths teacher or maybe a physicist. I didn't want to do either. So I became a hedge fund trader instead and then banker following that. Um, and like I was saying, RBC immediately before before Drone Shield, I, I felt I sort of outstayed my welcome in the banking world as it's one of these industries where it's a lot of fun in your 20s. But as you get older, it's it's not necessarily a job for everybody. So I was looking for something else. So I understand that these two dudes sitting in a garage uh, playing around with hardware and software, but they're in Virginia. They decide that they want to um, raise some dough as a result of a hedge fund in, or a fund in um, New York or Boston, mm -hmm. um, getting a bit excited about their technology and the potential for it, they decide to raise it in Australia. But why, why did they pick Australia instead of trying to do it on the NASDAQ? Or you can't probably couldn't get on the NASDAQ, probably didn't qualify at the time. But why didn't they try to raise the dough in the US? There are two ways of where at the time to raise money. One is West Coast VCs, and that really relies on relationships, which you either have or, or you do not, and they did not collectively. And West Coast being the, the, the valley, uh, San Francisco. Exactly, yeah. yes. And then um, the other one, of course, is listings on, uh, say, AIM in UK, which has been great, but not so good now, or Toronto Stock Exchange, which again- You're looking for retail. Uh, you, yes, looking for retail for an early stage business. Uh, NASDAQ and New York Stock Exchange, like you said, um, probably used to be more penny stock friendly back in the 70s. You know, you, you look at Wolf of Wall Street kind of movie, uh, but since then really been welcoming. If you're an Atlassian and you know you are billions of dollars in market cap, that's one story, but but not so much for an early stage business. Uh, so ASX was almost a remaining option and ASX really built itself on that reputation of fostering early stage businesses. I think the whole premise is to say in a lot of other countries, you allow private equity to get those really large returns from early stage businesses to when they're ready to list, and then you let retail jump in. While ASX, uh, I believe, has this philosophy of democ democratizing the situation by saying, well, we're going to let the little guy experience the big returns by allowing them to jump in early for um, small stocks. I think tradition has been biotech or, or mining in Australia, but can really be anything. So I consider us um, a bit like people talk about fintechs. Uh, we are deaf tech, defense technology business. I didn't realize that on a global basis, the ASX had sort of had that reputation. The traditional need for a startup, doesn't matter if it's defense tech or any sort of business, um, is capital. You need patient capital. The traditional way of raising that is that you get high net wealth people who tend to put in larger lumps of money um, and you therefore get fewer investors, fewer number of people with larger amounts of money. Let's say you're trying to raise 10 million, you might get five people at $2 million each. That's hard to get sometimes because those same people are being hit up by about a thousand different uh, promoters with a thousand different uh, opportunities. And sometimes it's either too small a ticket for them. They don't want to invest 500,000 or a million. They want to invest 10 million or um, they're already invested uh, or they've already invested enough in tech, tech itself or they've already got too much in defense. And they want to sort of put a little bit over here in retail or want to put a little bit into health or something like that. 
Um, so they can be a little difficult to get to. And when you said the West Coast, you talk about San Francisco. So you're talking about you know the the traditional Valley type investors, those high net wealth that come out of those environments, people who made stack of dough on various investments over time. They just keep investing a percentage of their total, total portfolio. That's one way of doing it. But it's a hard grind. And you're right. You've got to know people, and you've got to be in the Valley. You've got to be talking to people all the time. They expect you to probably open up an office there. Yeah, they have to become familiar with you, and they want to talk to you all the time. And they actually have some influence on you too. They will. It can be tough because they can sort of say, well, you know, we'll take 51% or we'll buy ourselves a veto right. Um, they'll sort of control it a bit and uh, they have a playbook. They all have playbooks. The other way of doing it, as you said, is that you can go and raise money retail. Generally speaking, those people put in lower amounts. Uh, they're sponsored by stockbrokers and or led by stockbrokers. Stockbrokers normally put that to their client list. They have usually have a client list and they sell it to their client list. Sometimes the stockbrokers club the deal. They might go to another stockbroker who has a, another client list, which doesn't, there's no crossover. They raise, I don't know, somewhere between maybe $50,000 amounts or along those lines. These are just mums and dads. Um, did you sit down as their CFO and take them through what the advantages of doing one compared to the other is? Or is it just a simple matter that, that we don't have connections to the Valley, it's too hard, we'll go and do the ASX? For us, it was pretty simply, like you were saying, we had no linkages or no really good way to go to the VCs. And also back then, we're talking eight years ago, the market, especially in Australia, but also even in the US, was not what it is today. Not as not as developed deep, uh, not as developed yeah. yes yes so this was really the the obvious option and and like you said being listed has a number of advantages one key advantage which i think in the current market a lot of unlisted companies are finding themselves in you are fairly certain you can do a follow up raise so if you if you need money thankfully we're now after the march raise in a very very good liquidity position but in the early years we needed to raise money every 6 months or every year can you tell me through that how did you work out how much you need to raise the first time? Probably knowing you have to go back again and again and again. It's really more art than science. Uh, so we're looking to raise five to seven million dollars. The way we figured it out was we would have had that lasting for at least one or two years. But how do you work that out? Uh, it, it's really an art where you figure out what is doable. So we're using Patterson's or part of Canaccord now in terms of- Patterson's the, uh, being the stockbroker? Uh, the broker was yep. advising us in the listing because when you are at that size, you currently use a Goldman. Uh, so- Go, uh, you, As in Goldman Sachs. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so then uh, so then the question is, what is actually doable? In the ideal world, yes, you want to raise $100 million, which will guarantee you you know, all the way to profitability. But you got to ask yourself, what is doable? And then go to the market, what, what is- doable but at the same time what you can make do with and the advice from patterson's at the time was that we should be able to raise five to seven um 20 cents a share is usually you know the valuation that a lot of young companies start with and and that will be enough for us for a year or two at that point we would achieve a number of milestones in terms of progressing the product progressing the markets and then you go back to the market with saying of you know here are all the things i've done for the last 12 months i might just package that up if you don't mind ollie so um the first thing the CFO would do would say to the founders, who at this stage own 100% of the thing, mm. um, um, and been probably funding it out of their back pocket and through a bit of money that they got through um, your original investors, who were the the Boston Fund. Um, between those groups, they own 100%. They're saying, "Well, it would be nice to raise 100 million, but." Um, we're probably not even worth 100 million at this stage, so we can't mm. raise 100 million. So the very first thing is you got to do is you got to say, how much money do we need? Let's say over the next 18 months, for argument's sake. And that goes back to the CFO, and CFO says, well, here's our business plan. This is how much staff, rent, whatever it's going to cost us five million bucks, just for argument's sake. And we've got no revenue at this stage. Okay. The next thing, Patterson's, who will be your sponsoring broker in this in your case which is just they're still around one of the one of the brokerage houses in sydney um in australia along with bill potter another one similar sort of style they will say to you okay well we think 20 cents a share is the right number 
but we better come and do some work on you and they'll talk to the CFO because we've got to go to our clients. We've got to let our clients know we've done the work on you. So we're going to start mm. asking you a whole lot of questions. It's sort mm. of like a due diligence process done by the corporate side of the sponsoring stockbroker because they have to say to their their client base, look, yeah, we've done some work on this. And they start asking hard questions like, you know, they examine your, you know, your your expense sheet and your budgets for the next couple of years. They examine the viability of who your customer base may be or who's going to buy you. And they ex they examine how much do you think you're going to sell your drone shield systems for and is it a license or whatever it is. And uh, then they and then they'll come back to you and say, okay, our corporate guys have done the job and uh, you know, we're happy with it with your thesis with drone sh shields thesis financial thesis built by oleg the cfo and they say we think we can raise five for you because you know the markets has this temperature at the moment so they assess the temperature of the market as well and so we can get we reckon that we got we got clients with an appetite of five million that might be you know um 100 people at Fifty thousand dollars each, or something along those lines. You have to say, well, how much of this we're going to give away? Because uh, you you got to talk to your current shareholders. They're saying, well, hang on, we don't want to give ninety percent of away. We don't want to end up with ten percent of the company. Mm. So you got to do a valuation. Sponsoring stockbrokers says, well, what do you reckon the value of Drone Shield is? And at this stage, you're a startup. How do you work out what the valuation is? Probably not profitable. Maybe only got a small amount of revenue. You know, it's a good idea. There's an addressable market. How do you work that stuff out? It's really art rather than science. So when I was a banker, I used to model, for example, toll road valuations, which is incredibly easy because you have traffic, you multiply by toll, you run the model out. You have and some do a multiplier of, and you and, come and, up with a number. And you, you, you do it, yeah. With a technology company in a emerging industry where, you know, you don't have that much of established business when you're starting, a lot of it really becomes... How do you kind of sketch things out and and have a scenario that both existing investors and the incoming investors are happy with? And you know, you tweak things. You you obviously want to generate enough liquidity so the whole business survives. I mean, the worst thing is, and and you know, the founders understood it as well. If you try to hold on too much to yourself in the beginning, then you'll end up holding nothing. Uh, so so it's a bit of a, you know, how do you increase the size of the pie? And then obviously each party wants to maximize their slice of the increasing in value pie. I've never been able to work it out. I mean, do you just say, oh, well, we found three other proxies around the world for technology in your case? Mm. There are two ways to do this and we've done both. So the first one is the comps or comparables, which is exactly like you said. So you try to find comparable Australian or global companies. Yep. Uh, for listed companies, it's relatively easy. You just take uh, where they're currently trading and you know you can get the, the multiples, the valuations at the time and show that you're attractively priced versus those companies who might be in comparatively similar stages. If it's an unlisted business, you try to pull statistics uh, for when they last raised money or maybe when the company got sold or what kind of multiples it was sold at. And then I guess more ground up way of doing it is you say, what is the size of the market opportunity here? Yeah, the so, addressable market. Addressable market. So yeah, what's the what's the estimated military budget for counter drone equipment? What you know, how many airports are there versus value of the installation of our equipment at one facility times the uptake rate and then you go across other customer groups like prisons power stations other things other then, sensitive uh, installations th that's right so you try to figure out addressable market and then you try to basically build like a ramp up into what you'd estimate your share of the addressable market to be and hopefully between the comps and that and the dcf you you have an answer that everybody's dcf and just kind of cash flow so you you project a cash flow out over a period of time. And by the way, I would say to anybody, go get an expert to do this, but you would predict a cash flow out based on the assumptions that you're just making mm -hmm. in relation to the addressable market, prices that other people are paying relative to technology. And then you would take that future income and discount it mm -hmm. to today's value. Mm -hmm. And that maybe lands you on a valuation today. So you take this valuation and you say, now it's worth 100 million. All we want to do is raise five because we are, we don't want to give away, you know, 20% of the business. We, we want to give away something, but we need five now. We're prepared to give away whatever five equals. 
So you got to present this information to both the sponsoring stockbroker, but you also got to present it to maybe you have to present it to the the potential audience of shareholders who maybe want to invest, and they've got to all scratch their head because you know this is all going to be very mathematical and uh, uh, financial modelling, uh, usually quite complex. Um, and of course, your that's your belly wick, that's your territory. You know this <laughs> stuff. It's bad enough that it's uh, it's it's hard enough for them for the investors that it's a. Uh, Technology they probably don't understand either, but uh, they get the sense of it. But you raise the dough, which is okay. So you've got a runway, and most people would say, oh, well, no, they raise five million, they've got an 80 month runway based on the, mm. the spending patterns. But, and you're at this stage, you're listed on stock exchange now mm -hmm. all of a sudden, mm -hmm. and you've got to report to the market. Now, the stock exchange, if you're losing money, they require you to do what every quarter? 4C. So you have yep. this quarterly statement which starts with the it's front a cash section. statement basically it's a cash statement yes so it's a a bit of a company update at the front and then full set of numbers for as, as far as the cash statement goes at the back and then if you have cash in the balance uh, or in your bank balance which is less than next two quarters based on how much money you would have just burned then you have to explain in the announcement why you believe you have more than next two quarters left to left to run. And look, I'll be honest, for the first few years, we were often running on just several quarters worth of runway, which can be a bit of a scary experience. And, Stressful. And can be hard when you're hiring new people as well. I remember we were hiring um, a person for a, a CFO role when I became the CEO, CEO, and she was competent enough to look at the last 4C and figure out that we only had a few more months of runway. And, you know, this is a person leaving an established job and looking to join. And she was risk, kind of, risk. The, exactly, exactly. So I think it takes a particular kind of person to join at the time. Uh, and profile of people changes, I guess, as you get more established when you- And, the, and, and the business matures and sometimes people don't keep up with that maturation process. But when, you, when you've done this and you've got, let's say you've got three quarters, three quarters of runway left. Mm. So on our example, you're in um, you know a month, uh, the quarter four, in an eighty month period or something mm. along, the, along mm. those lines. Yeah, that's right. Um, and you've raised five, so you've got like you know three quarters of left. Generally speaking, you know you've got to start getting ready to go back to the market. Now, lots of things can change. Like the macroeconomics of Australia can say, mate, you're not going to raise money, which is a sort of a situation we're sort of sitting in in Australia at the moment. It's a, a tough market to raise mm. money mm. from retail mm. because they've got so many options. They can put their money. They go buy CBA hybrids today for six point with six point five percent return. Mm. So CBA hybrids. So like it's by putting your money under deposit with CBA sort of thing, or ANZ hybrids five point seven five. So you being the CEO and uh, your sponsoring stockbroker, like if it was Patterson's, for example, um, they're going to be saying, it's going to be really hard to get the money, um, mm -hmm. Ollie, because these mm -hmm. people are going to say, well, hang on, I'm just going to sit on my money at the moment. I'm getting a really good return. It's in banks. It's government guaranteed effectively. Um, I don't want to take a risk on this because you're not going to pay a dividend yet, mm -hmm. um, but you need more money. Um, mm. because your runway is running out and you have you can't breach the 4C requirement from the stock mm. exchange because don't, you don't want to be sort of um, delisted or you don't want them to, uh, you know, suspend your, you from trading because that, that 4C thing is a very important quarterly yes. report. It's very important. That's why the ASX is doing it to make sure that shareholders are completely informed as to what's going on. So you need to raise more money. Clearly, the people who invested at 20 cents a share they want to be told, hey, we're going to raise more money, but this time we're going to raise it at 10 cents a share. They're, going to, they're saying, they want you to say, we're going to raise it, let's say, 50 cents a share or something more than what they pay because they want to see a profit, what they pay for, yes, relative to the amount that's being offered again to the marketplace. What are the sort of things you're trying to achieve? in? So what are the sort of metrics you're trying to do to put that second offering into the market at a that represents a profit to the first round shareholders so much so that they feel like reinvesting again or alternatively um, other people will feel encouraged because they think that you might turn that 50, the next round, the 50 cents around to a dollar for the round after. But what sort of things are you looking at in terms of trying to build metrics around that to demonstrate your ability to deliver? You always want to do an up round where you can. So if you last raise a Up round means? Uh, you want to raise at a higher price or high valuation of the business compared to what you've done last time. And that's the first thing you try to go out with. But at the end of the day, the most important objective is to have a 
meaningful raise so you can continue as a company. So if that does not happen with the up round, meaning you try to go and raise at 30 cents or 40 cents and you have no demand because generally once you list it, of course, the, the, the new shareholders will look at the share price where you're trading and say, well, you're looking to do a placement, an SPP, share purchase plan, which is like placement, but for retail shareholders. And you know, traditionally it's 10 to 20% discount. So if you're now trading at 25 cents, you cannot possibly go out at 30 cents because you, you're not going to get anybody interested. Because everyone expects this discount. Everybody expects to your, this discount. What they call your VWAP, your uh, yeah. Uh, volume, volume weight average, weight average price. price, yeah. <laughs> yes. So you roughly know the price at which you're going to be issuing. It's going to be 10 or 20%, 10 to 20% discount. Usually, more money you want to raise, more of a discount you need to give. But but that's the metric, right? And and ultimately, the main thing that matters is to raise money so the business can continue. And if you can make an up round, great. But the main objective is to raise, to raise the stay, money. Stay alive. Uh, stay alive. Yes. In the, in the early years, that's the main objective. You lose, you lose out. You know, you you know, you don't have any money. You lost basically. Yeah. Uh, so so you try to do that. Uh, sometimes it means you raise less money than you hoped. You know, like a lot of our follow-on raises were one or two million dollar raises. Even though would have loved to do more because that enabled us to stay in the game without doing a you know disastrous raise in terms of the discount to, to the share price. And the last thing on timing, you certainly don't want to be waiting when it's obvious to the market that you will be raising. So in, in finance terms, you call it come raise, meaning everybody expects you to go to the market and start raising and the share price will start dropping, which means you will need to raise at a discount to even lower share price because it's been reducing so you want to be raising before everybody starts expect you to raise uh, to actually optimize the share price of which you're raising and one of the things that's really important i think for people to understand is um there's a rule in the uh, asex rule that there's this thing called continuous disclosure um and that's about whatever you know that you think is significant or might you as a ceo in particular um that might affect the share price that you have to you the company that is drone shield has to disclose it to the market that is you post it up in the asx it's like it's like putting it up on facebook or something everyone gets to see it and most people have an alert on it if they're an investor and they get to see what you're saying good and bad yes it's not just good good and bad and the worst thing that can happen is you post something up that just happened out of the blue but you're it's getting very close to a period when you're trying to raise dough mm -hmm. raise money um it's there is a lot of management of a lot of processes around continually raising money, making sure that your run rate or your runway of cash is sufficient, making sure that you don't, that you you can't control it, but at least you keep the marketplace trading at a price that allows you to raise money down the track with too, without too big a discount so that you really upset your original shareholders or your original um, investors in the first round. It's a really complex, sort of, sort of nearly an algorithm, but it's there's, it starts to move into the science territory away from art. It starts off as art, but it starts to move into the science territory where you're actually looking at like you're doing brain calculations. I mean, I don't know if you could do this in a uh, algorithm on, on a piece of paper, but your brain's certainly trying to work out the recipe, mm -hmm. which is basically an algorithm. So, and. Uh, for those people who don't know this, this is quite a stressful process. Very, very stressful. It's it looks glamorous when you get to a point where you've just raised a large amount of money, like you guys have forty million dollars. You said earlier, mm. um, that sort of make, looks like you're through the gate just to, to some extent, mm -hmm. and your share price is relatively good. Mm -hmm. That's more rare, especially at the moment. Mm. Especially mm -hmm. at the moment um, in twenty twenty three. I'm talking about um, the what most people think think is, oh, well, I, I could do that. But this has been how long you've been, guys, been at it. You just mentioned you were raising one and two million dollar licks mm. at one mm. stage there. Must That's have right. got pretty tight. Yeah, yeah. For look, for a first maybe four or five years out of eight, you are, you know, you, you I mean, you know, you'll make it one way or the other, but you are living on. Uh, six to 12 months runway at any given point in time. I remember the other thing when you listed, um, when you put out your annual report, you have this 
thing that the auditors include in their report, which is statement of going concern, yeah. which is essentially the auditors saying, do these guys have enough cash to last for next 12 months or do they not based on the forecast, which you give to the auditors and, and on the cash. And every and, investor reads that. And every investor they, they, reads They go that. straight to that page. Yes. And look, I mean, I won't deny it. We had uh, a couple of periods where did we have 12 months of cash in a bank? No, we didn't. I mean, now it's a very different position and it's just the nature of being an early stage company. In summary, Drone Shield, you've done a great job at Drone Shield, okay? And Drone Shield, I don't know much about this technology, but it's great to see an Australian listed company doing something that has global significance. That's really good. And it makes sense. It's a rising tide because in terms of your revenues, because I can see the demand, there's clearly a rising tide for your product and service and license and technology. But one thing is for sure, using the ASX or any stock exchange is one one of the well-trodden routes to making to raising money to allow your business to grow to the level you want it to grow to but it has to be well managed it has to have good sponsors really good sponsors they don't just you don't want sponsors who just raise money and say see you later because otherwise you might experience a dump and pump technique mm. or pump and mm. dump technique where they pump you up and then they dump you mm. and you've got to you the ceo or you and the cfo and or ceo you have to keep r relationships with those people who are your sponsoring brokers. Mm. And it's important that they keep updated, irrespective of your obligations to update the marketplace. You sort of really want to keep them updated, yeah. good and bad, they don't, because they hate surprises mm. and they love information. How did you really go around that? Like, How did you go about that? Well, how do you build relationships with your sponsoring brokers and was it a daily or weekly or monthly update or did you do it by phone? Did you, had, and how did you do it during sort of COVID periods and those sorts of things? There's no quick solution or one thing, I suppose. It's just a whole array of techniques. So you, you try to create what is really highly differentiated business. So when the broker calls a wealth advisor calls their customers, it's not yet another mining company or a biotech stock, but something really unique. Having those kind of visceral product images, which is what we are well known for, is a really big differentiate, especially when it comes to retail. So creating that very different value proposition to what anybody else can think of and really easy to grasp. Everybody can look at Ukraine videos and see the both sides using drones extensively. So drones are a future of warfare. I heard once, for example, that it's comparable to introduction of body armor in World War One in terms of how significant it is. And in the military, everybody wants to fight the next war, not the last war in terms of what you bring into the battlefield. You know, you think about machine gun versus horses, you know, what we're seeing in World War One kind of thing. So giving the brokers that sort of highly differentiated story crafted or packaged in a way that they can present to the investors. So yes, I've been a drone shoot for eight years, but before that I spent over 10 years as a banker helping to craft those messages. So speaking that language that brokers and investors can understand and putting it in that, that way uh, to show the message, to say, here is our pathway, you know, here are all the things that we've done and things that we intend to, um, intend to achieve is is important during during COVID. Uh, we've done as everybody else a lot of virtual stuff. Uh, so you try to put out materials. I mean, thankfully, we were categorized as an essential business, being in the defense space, so we can continue our manufacturing and shipping. So the business didn't really stall. So it was actually one of our first big jumps in terms of the capital raise, going from that sort of one or two million dollar raises and doing a what was a 10 million dollar raise was actually right in the middle of COVID for us which was wow. which was really helpful so you you try to do that um you try to build relationships with your investors say i make a point of if a small investor that might hold thousand dollars worth of shares reaches me you try to engage with them you try to explain you know your message you, you don't ignore anybody you you run mailchimp campaigns like what for example i'm finding is a lot of investors may not have necessarily subscribed to ASX platform. So when we do an announcement to ASX, we also do after we release it to ASX, which is important. ASX announcements need to go first as first source of uh, news. But after that, 
release same news but via our MailChimp campaign to our mailing list of existing and, and investors and also brokers and, and other potential interested parties so they can see that news flow and they think about drone shield all of all of that and eventually builds up we we haven't found investor conferences to be hugely relevant uh to be honest and just kind of that direct campaign uh to shareholders probably been more useful for us well i i'm i'm really good i'm I'm glad to see you again but it's good to know that you are like fully engaged as an aussie in um something that's you know listed on the australian stock exchange but also has a, a big australian element to it um and there's something that's again that australian can export um, which is, you know, I know it was born in Virginia. I know you still guys still have an office there, but it's still, I feel as though it's completely Australianized. So, you know, we give citizenship mm-hmm. today to Drone Shield. <laughs> I gave Thank it to you. you eight years ago, but I'm now today giving a citizenship to Drone Shield and welcome to Australia and uh, keep doing a good job. So, thanks very much, Oleg Vornik, uh, CEO, Managing Director of Drone Shield, listed on the ASEX. Thank you, Mark.